Five left. Okay. Hey, Gene. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's just make sure that everybody can see the slideshow. Yeah, we'll get there Are in we... just a second. Okay, okay sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I want to welcome everybody. This is the December 2022 meeting of the Old Bull Pilots in Palm Springs. Uh, the group is meeting at the Palm Springs Air Airport. And thanks for Steve Elephant and uh, Patrick Shannon and Gary Luters and Bob Lilac. Uh, are able to put all this together. So uh, acknowledgement to you guys. I know that we're getting things worked out with regard to uh, coffee and logistics and workers in the background and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, we are very lucky to welcome uh, Mark Copeland. Uh, Mark Copeland has been involved with the 8th Air Force for a quarter of a century or more, 30 years at least. And I met him 25 years ago in St. Louis, uh, one of the... Uh, Eighth Air Force annual uh, renewals or uh, re reunion meetings, and it was phenomenal. Got a chance to to meet some really famous people. Lou Lyle, three-star general, flew uh, 100 missions in the Eighth Air Force when you were not supposed to last more than six. Uh, so an amazing uh, story. And uh, anyway, great. Uh, you're sharing uh, uh, just fine there, Mark. Right. Anyway, uh, Mark's background is in aviation uh, as well. He's been an operations manager, Northwest Airlines, uh, Sun Country Airlines, Compass, uh, uh, duty manager operations, and really knows uh, airlines pretty well. But the most important part is all of the people that he has met in his lifetime, all uh, the most famous of the famous. I, I've always considered myself to be an A player in World War II history, but I can't even see Mark's dust in terms of all of the people that he's met. Uh, I've met really, really fun people, but uh, uh, glad to introduce Mark. Uh, he's been to all of the famous places and knows uh, it really who's who in the zoo. I uh, got, got a chance to have dinner with uh, Mark and Mike Faley uh, with the 100th Bomb Group and Roger uh, Freeman, a famous author. Uh, that was in Savannah, uh, where we all got a chance to meet Paul Tibbetts. Yesterday, uh, Mark and I were talking with Paul Tibbetts IV, who will be presenting uh, next month. And I think uh, we were expecting uh, Paul Tibbetts to join us this morning, but I think this might have co collided with one of his doctor's appointments. But uh, we are uh, good to go. Mark, take it away. Thank you very much, Gene. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, yep. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for getting up so early. I'm uh, talking to you from my office in Lakeville, Minnesota, a suburb of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, where it's currently a balmy, I think, 30 degrees, uh, so it feels like Miami Beach outside today. It's nice to see people wearing uh, short sleeve shirts, and um, I, uh, I'm sure the weather's a little bit more favorable down in Palm Springs than in Minnesota right now. But I, uh, I'm thrilled to be to, to be with you all. And uh, as Gene mentioned, uh, we've had a long friendship for many years, and it's uh, 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 it's just an honor to be asked once again to join you folks uh, and talk a little bit about. Um, a really interesting subject that uh, Gene and I decided to talk about, and that's the beginning of the United States uh, Army Air Corps 8th Air Force in World War II. Um, I titled this thing from the Savannah Armory Building to the largest air armada ever assembled in human history. And I just want to walk you through in terms of, you know, some of the early days and some of the challenges that the leadership faced. So uh, we'll just get underway. Um, obviously, we knew what knew what happened on December 7th, 1941. America entered the war, uh, a global war for the first time. And uh, obviously, uh, in the in the waning days of the Battle of Britain, uh, the Spanish Civil War, that air power definitely was going to be a key element in regards to achieving uh, the victory uh, against the Germans, the Italians and the Japanese Empire. Um, so for the first time, you know, we were going to fight an air uh, an air war. Uh, in a campaign a world away, literally using exclusively American aircraft personnel and support and supply infrastructure. Let's think about that for a minute. So let's go back to the Great War and uh, to, to talk about a little bit of the bravery of the American airmen uh, that, uh, that flew in World War I. Um, they all flew. There were no American airplanes that were really involved in, in any great 
uh, measure in World War One, most of the most of the pilots were flying British and French aircraft. So this is this is kind of a new deal for the United States. We're we're going to go halfway across the world with American aircraft, American personnel, uh, American uh, support and supply infrastructure. And to think about that now, um, it's not really that big of a deal in 2022. You just throw everything in a C-17 and, and fly it anywhere in the world. But back in, back in World War II, we didn't have that capability. So today's focus on the lecture will be the early stages of forming the U.S. 8th Air Force in, uh, to, for operations in the United Kingdom. So where did it begin? Um, what, what are some of the challenges that the leaders faced? Um, and uh, where was the 8th Air Force headquarters? And we'll talk about some of the early days of uh, the early missions. So um, we'll proceed. So who was in charge of this? We um, uh, Germany declared war on the United States December 11th, 1941. And this is the guy that was in charge. I'm sure that everyone is familiar with this gentleman, General Henry Hap Arnold, who was the chief of staff of the United States Army Air Corps at the time in December of 1941. So he not only had to face the war in Europe, he had to face the war uh, also with Italy and also the Japanese Empire. So how did he orchestrate this, this amazing, incredible endeavor? Well, you, you uh, uh, no, no, nobody can task something like that uh, without some key infrastructure and key people. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So they knew that they had to bring uh, American aircraft and supplies over to the United Kingdom. And this is where it all started out. And this is the uh, January 28th, uh, the United States 8th Air Force was officially established in this building on 1108 Bull Street in Savannah, Georgia. It was a National Guard armory. Nearby in Savannah, Georgia was Hunter Army Airfield. So Arnold tasked, um, you know, a, a group of, of uh, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, pretty ambitious and pretty smart uh, uh, off in terms of officers to join and to, to actually go to Savannah, gather, and then just figure out how we're going to do this, how we're going to go fight a war, you know, an ocean away. And so this is the building that uh, that it was started in. This is this is currently what the building looks now. It's actually uh, a proper American Legion uh, uh, post. And out in front, they have a, a National Registry sign that this is the birthplace of the 8th Air Force. So on the second floor of the building is where they gathered. And this is what it looks like today. This is the upstairs ballroom of the Savannah Armory, uh, now the American Legion. And they set up tables and had the infrastructure laid out and, and basically tried to figure out how we're going to move and log logistically, uh, you know, get everything over to England to set up operations. So the 8th Air Force was actually established on the 28th of January, 1942. So we're only talking about six weeks after Pearl Harbor. So the guy in charge was, was this man, uh, Tui Spots. Carl Spots was assigned as the Chief Army Combat Command uh, in, in terms of the air, the air uh, branch. And he delegated and assigned um, the key people to uh, to get the infrastructure, the aircraft, the, the airmen. I mean, just an, an insurmountable amount of responsibility. But he had a very good team. And um, the first commander of the 8th Air Force was assigned to this gentleman, General uh, Asset, uh, Asset Duncan. Uh, Duncan had the command of the 8th Air Force beginning at Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, Georgia. And his job was to take the fledgling troops and basically whip them into shape and get ready to go overseas and, and set up the campaign. So every single step that they took uh, in planning this thing, everything was a, was a, new, a new door that was opened, a new, a new challenge, uh, you know, faced them every day. Um, once uh, General Duncan made it over to England, he was unfortunately killed in a transport plane um, on, his, on his way to Gibraltar on the 17th of November, 1942. So in in Savannah, this is actually this was Eighth Air Force Bomber Command. Um, I don't know any of the gentlemen that are in this picture. Um, it's more interesting just to see that the first headquarters of the Eighth Air Force, and this was uh, taken in March of 1942. So the living accommodations were not plush. It was tent city, and they billeted um, the the early uh, members of the Eighth Air Force in tents uh, in in order to um, uh, just give them a place to sleep. Obviously, you can see that um, uh, the conditions were 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 pretty primitive uh, before they 
either got onto a boat or brought airplanes over and uh, headed across the Atlantic to uh, to Great Britain. So what happened was is that Tui Spots said, I've got to send uh, you know myself and and some of the other key key players over to England to to set this thing up. So on the 20th of February, 1942, there were seven American 8th Air Force officers that actually arrived in England. On the bottom left, you can see Ira Aker and, and Carl Spots. We'll talk about General Aker in a second. On the right, to their right, um, uh, is General Frank Armstrong. And then uh, Fred Castle is on the upper left. Uh, he was actually a Medal of Honor winner. Uh, one of the 17 Medal of Honor recipients in the 8th Air Force. And then on the right uh, is Captain Bernie Lay, who um, not only was a was a, a brilliant tactician and a great leader, he was also the author of 12 O'Clock High. So he had, uh, he had a, an 8th Air Force afterlife, and we all know the story of that not only great book and, uh, and superb film. So here's a picture of... of uh, uh, General Armstrong in Spots and Acre. And for the first time in U.S. history, as I mentioned, we're going to fight a war on foreign soil with all American aircraft personnel and equipment. And they started with seven air, seven men and no airplanes. So this is February of 1942. Where do they end up? This is 8th Air Force headquarters, a place called Wickham Abbey. And this was uh, Station 101, and it was a code word, Pine Tree. Pine Tree was the, as I mentioned, was the code word to identify the headquarters of 8th Air Force Bomber Command from 1942 to 1945. This is a this is a, a picture of the grounds of Wickham Abbey, um, which actually was a girls' school. Uh, the 8th Air Force and REF Bomber Command commandeered the school, and they took it over as their headquarters during that period. And so the first American officer, 8th Air Force officers, actually arrived to the Abbey uh, April 15th of 1942. Here's a nicer little color shot of it. And this is where they uh, they set up command. Um, this is where uh, Tui spots and uh, orchestrated the whole thing. And here we can see General Aker, who was actually, after uh, after Duncan was, was killed in the flying accident, even before that, uh, Aker was handed 8th Air Force. That was going to be his command, was setting up the, the strategic daylight bombing campaign the fighter escorts, all the, uh, you know, the base operations, uh, quite an insurmountable task. But here we can see him sitting in his, in his desk. Um, and this was just taken, this photo I took uh, in late uh, November, or I'm sorry, late October of this year, uh, I got permitted to bring a, a, a group, a tour basically uh, that I, um, uh, that I developed and then, uh, then actually led uh, 25 people from the National Museum of the Mighty Eighth Air Force and we started our journey at High Wickham, and we actually got the opportunity to go upstairs and I walked into Ira Aker and Jimmy Doolittle's office, which was quite uh, quite something. And this is actually what it looks like from the outside. This is the part of the Abbey where Eighth Air Force headquarters was at. The that actual office is the up on the second floor. It's the uh, the first window on the left. So here's some of the other early commanders uh, of the Eighth Air Force pictured at the headquarters. Um, probably the most notable is Leon Johnson in the upper left. He was the commander of the 44th Bomb Group, the Flying Eight Balls that shipped them, a B-24 Liberator group that also participated in the famous Ploesti mission of August 1st, 1943. He was also awarded the Medal of Honor, one of the 17 uh, uh, members awarded. Uh, just to his, to his uh, uh, immediate right, uh, sitting on the couch is Ossie Duncan, the gentleman that had 8th Air Force, uh, uh, you know, command. Unfortunately, we mentioned earlier that he was killed in a flying, uh, in, a, in a crash um, on his way to Gibraltar in November of 42, and some of the other uh, sundry officers. So as I mentioned earlier, the guy that really, really, really started as the first real commander of the 8th Air Force was General Ira Clarence Aker, uh, born in Field Creek, Texas, he joined the, uh, the Army Air Corps, the U.S. Army, um, just after the Great War, and he transferred into the U.S. Uh, Flying Service in 1918. He was a very, very skilled and respected pilot, and he, was, uh, he ran up through the ranks, was a very, very trusted individual in regards to, to uh, handling that command, and was promoted to Brigadier General in January of 1942. 
So upon arriving in England, of course, the British press were very, very interested in these these new Americans and uh, doing this daylight bombing. And, you know, they were they were more or less uh, uh, just very, very interesting um, in regards to, you know, the British folks. So he, um, you know, naturally wanted to, to be quoted by the press. And there was a famous quote that he said, we won't do much talking until we've done more fighting after we've gone. We hope you'll be be glad that we came. Um, that was very, very popular in the British press. And uh, he, he was quite the, um, uh, you know, kind of the uh, purveyor of, of uh, you know, saying the right thing and, and starting a good relation with uh, not only the British uh, people, but of course, uh, RAF Bomber Command. So he had this ominous task of, like I said, starting up this infrastructure and his goal, an anonymous, amazing goal, uh, and it was very frowned upon by the British. They just said, you guys are nuts. You're going to, you're, you're going to bomb during the day. Um, that's, we've tried it and we had appalling losses. Uh, what, th what, what makes you think that you can do it? Well, he believed in strategic precision daylight bombing is a reality. And he developed a really good uh, relationship with the RAF Bomber Command uh, to develop the round the clock bombing theory. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. So we'll go to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the um, RAF Bomber Command for a moment. Um, this gentleman here, Sir Arthur Harris, was the Marshal of the Royal Air Force and Supreme Commander of RAF Bomber Command. So their theory, of course, was to bomb at night and to develop a stage in regards to um, doing a, a, a different type of bombing instead of more of a strategic nature. Um, there's a picture of, of Harris at his desk in Wickham Abbey, but more of a strategic na nature. The RAF developed um, a strategy called dehousing or area bombing uh, for selected German targets, where basically German, German cities, um, they wanted to destroy the morale of the German population uh, by obviously uh, you know, uh, doing a, a dehousing thing or basically in a, in a not very nice way saying carpet bombing. And they developed the round the clock theory. So Aker and, and, and Harris had to get along in regards to uh, making this theory of the round the clock thing, Americans bombing by day, the Germans bombing by night. We would just never let uh, Germany rest in regards to uh, a bombing campaign. So there the two of them are, um, there's bomber Harris on the left and General Aker on the right, and they there's some historians that that kind of say that they 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 got along because they had to. Um, I uh, they they had some differences in opinion. I think the relationship, in my opinion, nurtured over time, and I think that they really got a really good respect for one another. Um, they were both going through very trying times, especially in 1943. Uh, the RAF Bomber Command uh, was just. The, the losses were appalling, as were the ones for the Americans. And so they they sh they shared a really great responsibility and uh, a, a pretty heavy burden for not only, um, you know, creating this round the clock bombing theory, but obviously living with the, the appalling losses. So the first American raid actually was on July 4th, 1942. Um, as you can see, that's not a B-17 or a B-24. Those are actually Douglas A-20 Havocs, or better known in a Lend-Lease thing, the RAF Boston 3. So Americans were assigned to 266 Squadron. And on the 4th of July, there were 12 of the Bostons that went uh, and attacked some aerodromes along the Dutch coast. Six of those Bostons were accrued all by American flyers led by Captain Charles Kegelman or Keg Kegelman, and Kegelman led the uh, led the mission. Um, they didn't really do that much damage. Here's a here's an American crew um, staying in front of one of those Boston's. Um, that July Fourth raid was really kind of politically motivated. They were more or less um, kind of pushed into doing that as a morale boost to the American public. They wanted to bomb the Germans on the Fourth of July. Um, that was basically the 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 motive of it. And um, you can see here uh, one of the bombs that's actually being loaded into it. Um, General Spots and Aker protested against the raid. They said, we're not ready to do this. And Aker even was re uh, remarked at one point that Washington has July 4th mixed up with April Fool's Day. And so they went in, um, they bombed the, 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 uh, uh, the, the uh, aerodromes. Um, here's here's Kegelman and his crew standing in front of his Boston. Kegelman is standing on the far right, the, the uh, leader of the mission. 
and they hit the they hit the targets. Um, but like I said, they didn't really inflict much damage. But boy, it sure was good press. And here, uh, three days later, on the uh, four days later, rather on or no, correction, seven days later, a week later, uh, this is uh, Carl Spatz de decorating uh, the airman that flew that mission on July 11th, 1942. But then we'll talk about, now we're ready to do this. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to actually use American aircraft for the first time, and we're going to bomb the Germans uh, in, in occupied Europe. So that first mission was actually orchestrated and flown by the 97th Bomb Group. This was the first mission on the 17th of August, 1942. There were 12 B-17E Flying Fortresses that participated in the raid. One of them, the lead ship, was 41-2578 uh, uh, serial number, better known as Butcher Shop. And that airplane was the lead B-17 that dropped the first bombs on Fortress Europe on that date, the 17th of August. Leading the mission was uh, maybe a gentleman that you'll, you'll recognize on the left uh, and the grandfather aforementioned of what Gene said with uh, General Tibbetts that's going to be the guest speaker next month and, and a great guy. This was his grandfather, of course, Lieutenant Colonel, hey, or, I'm sorry, uh, Major, uh, Major uh, Paul W. Tibbetts, who's Martin. in the upper left. Yes. Uh, Paul has joined us. Fantastic. Paul, good would morning. you like to? Yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. Good morning. Uh, jump on. Can you uh, uh, start your uh, your video for a second? And say hi to the group. There he is. There we go. Hey guys. Good morning. It's good to be here with you. Thanks. Uh, enjoying this presentation. Yep. Uh, General Tibbetts was with us yesterday as we were reviewing the slide deck, but uh, uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, Paul here with us next month uh, doing a presentation. So anyway. This is a perfect time to uh, to do this because uh, Mark and I were able to meet uh, the Tibbetts family in Savannah in 2002 at the 60th mm -hmm. uh, reunion. So we got a chance to meet everybody. And uh, that was a special time for me uh, when the grandfather, uh, I walked up to him to get an autograph. And he says, Mr. Anderson, I want to talk to you for a minute because I was working on my 12 o'clock high book. And uh, so when he, that was a special time. Anyway, back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Paul. It's great to have you. And I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting your grandfather many times. And he was uh, he, he will and always will be one of my all time heroes and quite a gentleman. But getting Amen. back to Thanks. the present. No, getting back to the presentation. Um, and we can actually talk about this. Leading the mission was the mission commander was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Armstrong, who was to the right. He actually supposedly was the subject for Bernie Lay's character in 12 O'Clock High, General Frank Savage. He actually modeled the role of what later Gregory Peck would, would uh, uh, I mean, I mean uh, emulate on the screen. He modeled the role after Anderson, which is kind of interesting. But Anderson needed a, needed a guy that he could depend on that he knew was steady. He knew that um, uh, he, he, would, he would be the perfect leader in terms of the, uh, the command pilot, and he chose Paul Warfield Tibbetts, uh, a major at the time in the upper left. So this is another of the B-17Es. This is Yankee Doodle that actually carried General Ira Aker, the commander of the 8th Air Force. I mean, you kind of roll the dice, and they don't know what, what the German Luftwaffe was going to do, but uh, Aker actually flew the first mission and was aboard this airplane called Yankee Doodle. So let's turn the tide over a little bit to the 8th Air Force Fighter Command. Um, they, they knew at some point that, that fighters were going to be an integral part, not only as, as far as escort uh, and also ground support or ground attack. Uh, and they had to have an 8th Air Force Fighter Command. And this is the first man that was given that task, Frank O'Driscoll Monk Hunter. He was the first um, uh, commander of 8th Air Force Fighter Command, uh, a great war veteran with nine aerial victories to his credit. You can see that um, he had a, had a kind of a certain panache with the riding crop and the, uh, the big uh, kind of almost handlebar mustache, quite a character. But also you have to remember that 8th Air Force Fighter Command um, they really didn't have anything in, in terms of infrastructure, except Monk Hunter had a, had a kind of an ace up his sleeve. Why I interject this slide is that we, we can talk all morning about the neutrality acts of 1935, 37, 39, 
that America was going to be an isolationist nation. They didn't want to get involved in another uh, European war. They didn't want to participate in uh, defending Britain when it stood alone. Um, but there was a way, and that was a way that they could funnel, although it was completely against uh, American law, they funneled American pilots through Canada. And they joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, and they joined eventually the, the Royal Air Force. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the, the three American Eagle Squadrons. These were proper British uh, fighter squadrons that were equipped with RAF aircraft. They wore RAF uniforms. They were given RAF um, either sergeant pilot or pilot officer pay. And uh, they, except the, the squadrons were completely uh, all American. Uh, all these gentlemen that you see in the in the in the uh, picture here, those are all part of Seven One Eagle Squadron, uh, and they were all Americans. Um, they the, then again they were also something that was kind of a kind of a press favorite. This was a stage photograph where they a simulated a, a, a squadron scramble uh, towards their Hawker Hurricanes, and then uh, here's a here's a picture of Seven One Eagle Squadron, uh, another publicity fo uh, photo, but. What's, what's the reality of this is that uh, over half of the pilots in this picture um, by, by war's end were killed or they were missing in action. So Monk Hunter actually thought about this. He negotiated with the British and he said, I need experienced pilots to start out 8th Air Force Fighter Command. So all three of the Eagle Squadrons converged on a, on a British base called Debden. And on the 29th of September, 1942, all the pilots you see on this rainy day uh, in, at the, in the parade ground there, uh, all those pilots um, marched in as Royal Air Force uh, pilot officers or Royal Air Force fighter pilots. And with the changing of the flag, instantly they became uh, part of the United States Army Air Corps uh, in the first uh, group in 8th Air Force Fighter Command. So 7 one, 1, 3, 1, 2, 1 and 133 Eagle Squadron became 334th. 35th and 36th Fighter Squadron of the famed 4th Fighter Group. And this is the first airplane that they flew. You'll recognize that. That's a, That obviously is a, is a British Supermarine Spitfire Mark V. Uh, the only note of difference is that they took the REF uh, Roundel, painted it out, and they put the American Star, or what's commonly referred to as the Ball Star. So Obviously, as 8th Air Force uh, Bomber Command started um, with with the lack of really good fighter escort, the Pentagon pushed for, for deeper penetration. Uh, they, they wanted to go farther and farther. And the bombers, of course, as, as you probably all know, were, were virtually unprotected. Um, the, the losses in uh, the, the spring of 1943 uh, going into uh, the summer uh, all cascaded in, in a series of raids that Aker had to face. Um, the, the appalling losses of uh, August 1st, 1943, were three uh, eight Air Force bomb groups, the 44th, the 93rd, and the 389th part participated in that epic raid where 50, 58 bombers were lost. August 17th, the double strike mission to Schweinfurt Regensburg, 68 Air Force heavy bombers were lost just on that single mission. And then we move into October of 1943, uh, during Black Week, where the targets of Bremen, Marienburg, and Munster, um, uh, the, the appalling losses just within three days, uh, 30, 18, and 30 heavy bombers, all to be crescendoed to the famous October 14th, 1943 raid, uh, Second Schweinfurt, or better known as Black Thursday. Once again, the United States 8th Air Force lost 60 heavy bombers. With 10 men on an airplane, you can do the math. Um, these missions were were just catastrophic in, in regards to loss. So General Aker felt, faced all these grim statistics and tried to keep the theory of and sustain the heavy uh, uh, bombing campaign uh, and, and make it a reality. But the the real the real hard facts of it by the fall of 1943, as you all know, you had to complete 25 missions to make a full combat tour, and then you could be rotated out. But in 1940, the fall of 43, um, after those October missions, the average life expectancy of an 8th Air Force bomber crew was just seven missions, which is a lot to, uh, a lot to live with um, if you're a 19 or 20-year-old kid um, halfway across the world fly, fighting a war. So on that, that period, as I mentioned, they lost 138 heavy bombers and 38 fighters. Almost 1,400 airmen uh, were lost 
uh, or taken as, uh, as prisoner. So Arnold and Spots knew that they had to change, they had to change the course of the air war in, in Europe. And we, we talked about it yesterday. Sometimes, you know, if a, if a football team is having a, is having a bad season, um, you don't replace their players, you replace the coach. And maybe it's the coach is the problem. So they decided to take Ira Aker out of, out of that command and put this man in charge, General James Harold Doolittle, um, who I'm sure you all know, uh, was born in Nome, Alaska, uh, had a doctorate in aeronautical engineering, uh, engineering at MIT, went on obviously as a famed air racer in the 1930s or 1920s and 30s, accomplished many aviation firsts, but of course, um, most well known for the Doolittle Raid on the 18th of uh, uh, April, 1942, where Doolittle led this epic mission. Uh, you all know it. Um, it's one of the most uh, daring and uh, uh, incredible uh, American military actions, not only in World War II, but in our nation's history. So Doolittle decided that he was going to come in and change the tactics. First, the priority was destroy the German Luftwaffe, whether it's in the air or it's on the ground. We've got to take out the Luftwaffe in regards to um, uh, changing the tactics. Um, you know, and also uh, as far as the escort, the escorting of bombers was yes the primary target, but his his uh, his theory was to at all costs kill the Luftwaffe, whether it's uh, like I said on the air or on the ground. Um, this is just a map of of Great Britain uh, that Gene wanted to kind of kind of bring into the fold. Um, I think you all can see London uh, just in the southeast corner of England, and uh, just to the north and north uh, east of it is East Anglia, and that's the concentration of where all the bomber and fighter bases were at. And then just to the left of London, you can see High Wycombe. That's where we, we visited earlier, where 8th Air Force uh, uh, headquarters was at. And this is a little bit more of a detailed map of that area. And you can see that the airfields are literally on top of one another. Let's also remember, put yourself in, in a place where you were, you were 20 years old and you were an aircraft commander or first pilot on a B-17. You got a crew of nine kids in the back of it. You take off on, a, on a, a foggy morning. You go up through the overcast. There's no air traffic control. There's no TCAS. There's no collision avoidance system. There's no radar. There's no GPS. There's nothing. And you circle on time and altitude and corkscrew up through uh, an overcast, or maybe it's a clear day. And you take off and form up and you start to, to head over Fortress Europe. And by the time you leave the English coast, everybody's trying to kill you. And you might take off on a beautiful, gorgeous uh, uh, blue sky morning. But in the afternoon, you return and it could be literally zero, zero. There was no ILS. There was no um, GPS. There were no, um, you know, uh, anything in terms of an approach control. They would send a jeep down at the at the end of a base and basically put up a, a beam to make somewhat of like an ND, NDB approach. But these kids, um, they they flew this, and, and actually the the mid air collisions and things along that nature were, were commonplace. But you think about what what you had to do, um, and then on your on your return in, in really really hazardous weather conditions, your hydraulics might be gone. You might have an engine out. You either have wounded or killed on board. Um, your your electrical system is out. I mean, all these these things that that could go wrong, obviously on a mission. And you did that twenty five times, and you got the to the right to go home. So as as the war went on, as I said, uh, uh, Doolittle wanted to have better fighter escort, but he had something that came along, and that was the North American P fifty one Mustang coming into service in late uh, February of nineteen forty four. He, uh, that, uh, you, I, I won't have to bore anybody about the fabulous, uh, you know, P-51 and its range and its, uh, its capability to escort bombers way deep into Germany and uh, protect them, you know, from almost takeoff to touchdown. So by the end of the war, there were the, the, the uh, as far as the heavy bombardment groups in that map we saw earlier, there were 40 heavy bombardment groups that were assigned to 8th Air Force Bomber Command. And by the end of the war, 15 fighter groups. That doesn't count the um, uh, reconnaissance group and the support uh, squadrons and things along that line. And Doolittle um, took over the 8th Air Force in January of 1944, and it went all the way through uh, to the end in 1945. 
so we we started the the presentation here with the uh, with the July fourth, nineteen forty two raid, uh, where there were just six American uh, crewed uh, Boston three bombers that that hit an airfield on the Dutch coast. The first mission only had twelve B seventeens on the seventeenth of August, nineteen forty two. But let's look at this statistic. In, in less than two and a half years, or basically two and a half years, on the 3rd of February, 1945, the Eighth Air Force flew its largest single mission, and that was targeted to the German capital of Berlin. In all, there were over 2,300 Eighth Air Force heavy bombers and escort for fighters that participated in that raid. That is what this country did in that short amount of time under um, uh, very, very heavy challenges in regards to the infrastructure. And you're looking at the Mighty Eighth um, during World War II, which was the greatest air armada, air armada ever assembled in hu human history. But the success of the Eighth Air Force never would have been possible without those seven men that came to England with no aircraft to High Wycombe uh, in April of 1942. So here's the cold, grim statistics that we that we can that we all can remember. Twenty six thousand Eighth Air Force personnel were killed in action during World War II. Twenty eight thousand were were POWs. The RAF, uh, although they fought longer, lost over fifty five thousand RAF airmen that were killed uh, during World War II, with uh, almost ten thousand RAF airmen becoming pris prisoners of war. So um, I guess the lesson and the takeaway, obviously today, is that. Never ever forget the courage and their bravery and their sacrifice uh, to to all that who love liberty and freedom and uh, may they all rest in peace. So I appreciate your attention, everybody, and uh, would open it up for discussion or any questions or answers. Steve, I'll open it up to you guys. Oh, while Steve is coming around, I also want to say that we have Arthur Dawson uh, uh, with us today, who was at Wendling uh, Airfield, uh, who is there uh, as a uh, that actually worked in as an electrician, uh, the British, but uh, supporting the uh, Americans. So, anyway, Steve, uh, you're good to go. Okay. So, not to understate the, the mission of the case, but I know that in the U.S., 20% of the planes built for World War II, 70,000 were lost in stateside training accidents. Do you have any statistics about how many of the airplanes that were lost were actually accidents? You know, you're talking about the weather and returning to base. And is there is there a number for that? Yeah, there is. I, I um. You got to give me uh, a little, a little bit of a, uh, um, a mulligan here, I guess, or whatever, to look it up and give you a proper statistic. Um, but you, you, you drive a really great point. Um, the training accidents alone, uh, just here in the United States, um, there, there were, there were a lot. We'll put it that way, because America was was in a hurry. We had to train, and we had to, to get pilots and uh, and crew members. Uh, you know, up to speed as quickly as possible to get them to to fight the war. Um, you know, it was it was uh, uh, you know a huge challenge in terms of the training operation. But to give you a, a hard statistic on how many aircraft were were lost in the Eighth Air Force or just in general in combat, I'd have to do a little digging. Um, I could send Gene an email uh, and and or uh, uh, one of the folks in the Old Bull Pilots thing maybe just to put onto their website or. Uh, you know, bring up maybe next month during a discussion with uh, with General Tibbets. Can you hear me okay now? Okay, good. Yep. Other questions? Well, way in the back. All right. All right, I can yell. Can you hear me? Yeah. And I'll wait. I'll wait. Don't let that be too. Yeah, the question is, uh, I, I think the presentation was great, but thank you. Isn't the uh, could you tell us a little bit about the current Eighth Air Force Museum in Savannah? Oh yeah, it's fantastic. But don't they also do kind of walkthroughs of missions and stuff? If anybody, oh yeah. For for those who are not familiar, um, 
in Savannah, Georgia, like we talked earlier in the, uh, the birthplace of the 8th Air Force, um, is the National Museum of the Mighty 8th Air Force. Uh, that museum uh, is, is simply world class. Uh, they uh, have a, a museum that's dedicated not only to the member to memory of those who fought in World War II, but uh, also through all the campaigns that the Eighth Air Force has participated in, and where what they currently do, uh, where they're stationed at Barksdale Air Force Base, uh, the museum has um, a, a B-17. In my opinion, probably the most accurate and complete uh, B-17 in the world. Uh, they have gone to great measures to make that absolutely perfect. All the turrets work. Um, it's uh, called Cydia Savannah, which was actually an airplane, a real airplane that was uh, that was uh, with the uh, 388 Bomb Group at Netishal. Um The museum uh, is is just like I said, a world class facility, and I know that uh, they're working very very hard on doing a thing in terms of um, uh, procuring a liberator. Uh, they're going to, they're doing a capital funding campaign right now to do a build out of about 150,000 square feet. Uh, they've got a B-17, as I mentioned, they need, they want a liberator. Uh, that's getting very close to, to being done. I personally was asked um, about a year and a half ago, and maybe I can touch on this a little bit. Um, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this upcoming mini series called Masters of the Air. Uh, that's a, a production that's being done by Playtone Studios with Tom Hanks, uh, Steven Spielberg, and all the rest of them that did such a remarkable job on Band of Brothers in the Pacific. Uh, this is going to be the third in the trilogy, and it's about the 8th Air Force, mainly the 100th Bomb Group, uh, which was stationed at Thorpe Abbott's. And the story will tell through characters of the real, real characters of the 100th, basically the story of the 8th Air Force. Um, it's been in development for a little over nine years. Um, they have they've uh, completed the the film. There there has been some delays, and nobody's really exactly sure on when it's going to when it's going to come out. Um, it was supposed to come out in the spring. I know they've had some uh, some delays uh, associated with the production. My guess is it's going to be more realistically next fall. Um, I was asked by the museum uh, about a year and a half ago because of my extensive travels to Great Britain to uh, develop a, a, a quote unquote, a dream trip. And they, they figure with Masters of the Air coming out that the interest in the 8th Air Force is going to just be meteoric. And uh, they want it to be ready and in position to offer commercial uh, tours, basically museum sponsored tours of London and East Anglia. And uh, this past October and November, I led a, a group of 25, uh, shall we say, friends and family, board members and things along that line on a uh, kind of a preseason game, if you will, or a test tour. And it was fantastic. Um, we used all four and five star uh, properties in terms of hotels, um, fantastic meals. Uh, we took folks to three, I'm sorry, four B-17 bases, one B-24 base uh, and fi uh, three fighter group bases. You got a chance to go to High Wickham uh, and do a behind the glass tour of the Churchill War Rooms, which is, it's just incredible. And uh, we, we had a really, really wonderful time. We're still in the development stages and we hope by the spring of this year, that's gonna be, a, that's gonna be an offering. So if you've ever wanted to have that, that major Stobel uh, standing on the hard stand on 12 o'clock high, and, uh, and feeling and, and really immersing yourself into a really comprehensive uh, experience uh, about the 8th Air Force. Um, go to their website in a few months. And like I said, we'll be, we'll be offering that as a commercial venture. So there's some exciting things that are going on in the museum right now. All righty, any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Oh, <laughs> Yes, one question. I, I always had my, my uncle actually went on the raid with school little actually. And I was always curious, how did he come back? If I remember correctly, he went out with the rest of the uh, squadron. And so how Are, you're you're talking the, 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 the Doolittle raid in April of nineteen forty two? Yes. Your uncle was on the raid? Yes. <laughs> who, who was your uncle? Uh, his last name was you know, uh, thing. So yeah, he was um um, 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 I don't know if he actually went over, but I know that he was training with all those guys. Um, all all right, okay. Doolittle made it out through, yeah, like you said, they they had it set up where he uh, he went through China, 
obviously where he landed and then uh, uh, made his way back through kind of the China Burma India theater and then uh, obviously got back to the United States um he uh uh they didn't really kind of let him know because um they knew that that it would be um you know nothing that he wanted to to really be a part of but they uh they basically um without any warning brought him to the white house and they brought him in to meet the president at the time of course was franklin roosevelt and uh he was awarded the medal of honor rightly so and um he always said that uh that he just wore the medal the medal was for the 80 gallant men that flew that mission yeah my uncle he actually went down in typhoon and after the war ironically when he went back home so i never got to meet him yeah. wow yeah. all righty any other questions I wanted to let uh, Paul Tibbetts jump in because he is, uh, I think you're the president now of the, his, his society, right, Paul? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, the 8th Air Force Historical Society. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Jay, so yesterday, just for the guys that are on the, uh, on the line here, yesterday we were talking a little bit about Mark's involvement in the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And I said, oh, that's kind of interesting because uh, – he was the youngest, I think, Mark, you said one of the youngest or the youngest folks to yeah. to be in that organization back a few decades ago yeah. or so. And I said, well, actually, today I'm the youngest guy involved in it now. I believe uh, it. it's a great it's a great little group uh, for the team here. You know, our, our role is to help keep the Eighth Air Force history alive and to honor our veterans. Uh, the society <laughs> was organized uh, really for war, too. And what we're trying to do now is expand that and include. Uh, the rest of 8th Air Force that's existed post-World War II, because there's actually a lot of 8th Air Force that's existed since World War II, uh, and it's still alive today. So I'm trying to help the organization grow a little bit and expand, not to exclude our World War II veterans. We would never do that or honor them or recognize that history, but to include more of the history that's happened since 1945, which there's quite a bit of it. Uh, and I spent 30 years of my career in 8th Air Force, so uh, I'm fairly familiar with that. So yeah, it's a great to be involved in that organization and trying to help it kind of transform and uh, morph into something that can exist into the future. Uh, on a side note, somebody asked about the museum. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a family <laughs> business. It's a family business, right, Mark? It's a family That's business. Right. <laughs> um, so after I got involved in the historical society, um, they asked through a series of conversations that I won't get into, but they were looking for somebody to help them with the social media aspects of today. And my daughter, whom that's what she's getting her degree in at SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. My daughter, who, which is where the museum is, by the way, she, uh, she said, well, you know, I might be able to help. Well, she's now, I will say employed, but really a volunteer helping the historical society. But she, through that work and going to the museum was hired by the uh, uh, National Museum of the 98th Air Force to be their social media chairman. So now she's working for the museum, which is pretty exciting stuff. That's she's, awesome. She's got her own little her own little passion for this work. And by the way, she's only 22 years old. So it's not like she's, you know, in her 30s and trying to find work. She's in her 20s and trying to find work. Uh, <laughs> but very passionate about very passionate about um, her her great grandfather and military history in general and especially as it relates to this conversation that uh, Mark reached a great presentation today. So thanks. thanks, Paul. You know, I, I actually have a question for you, Paul, and, and maybe you can lend some comment on that. Obviously, your grandfather sure. was was well known for events that happened uh, in, in August of 1945. Um, but, did, you know, in, in all the years that, that you uh, you shared and heard his stories and and things on that line, did he ever talk about that first mission with the 8th Air Force at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a great question because it's not something that people – many people will immediately recognize, right? They'll say, Correct. well, we know we flew the Enola Gay, and my grandfather said, Abs you know, obviously he's very proud of, of the end of, his, of, that, of the war and the part that he played in that very important role in leadership, right, to be able to pull off a mission of that magnitude as a lieutenant colonel. He was actually a colonel when he flew it, but the whole planet, he was a lieutenant colonel, which just boggles my mind. Uh, that would never happen today. But... He wrote a book, and in his book and in his presentations that he would do from about 1987 when he left uh, executive jet aviation, became NetJets. And when right. Warren Buffett bought that company and changed it to NetJets, my grandfather was chairman of the board. Of course, 
it was time for him to go. He'd been with the company, started the company, and had been with the company for 20 years. He put his book out and then started doing book tours and book signings and speeches and engagements. And he, he talked a lot about the early part of his career because, to be honest with you, that's the part that he loved the most. I mean, he, he was very proud of his work at the end there. But his time in England and his time in, uh, in North Africa and his time flying B-17s, or, or I would say, no, I would say, he would say some of his fondest memories and experiences. So, yeah. Interesting. I had a question, Paul. Yeah, he loved it. Is your daughter a pilot too? <laughs> you know, it's funny you ask that. I have a son who's 20, uh, getting married to be 21. He has no interest in the military. My daughter has always been the one that had this uh, enthusiasm about the military and then kind of faded a little bit, which is not atypical. And I will say, I will let you know, this is not that she wouldn't be upset about this, but just a few months ago, she came to me. She goes, you know, Dad, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe going in the military. I think I'd like to fly the B-2 and get one of those spirit numbers. I go, yes. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Um, and the interesting thing about her is that if she were to do that, she would fly the B-21 as well, of course, because uh, you know, B-21 is coming online later this decade. So she would have the opportunity to fly, you know, what would be at that point, the two self bombers we've built, right? But we only have one flying right now. So, yes, sir, we're, we'll see. We'll see. She, uh, she's still working through all of that, but we'll see. Where, she said, you know, Dad, I've always wanted to serve. And. I've always had this passion for doing the kind of work that you did. I just don't know exactly how I want to do it, but flying would, would be great. And she said, but I could also not fly. I could be, I could do something else. I just want to serve. So I think, I think she will do something. I don't, we'll see if she flies. We'll see where that goes. So. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right, Gene, if you could thank our speakers and sign off. Well, uh, Arthur, I think you had a question, didn't you? You're muted, Arthur. You need to unmute yourself. Arthur, hold on. Arthur, unmute. Ar Arthur, you need to unmute yourself. Can't hear it. It's okay. He can't hear it. Let's keep doing it. There's a commercial. We'll figure it out. There we go. I would like to thank Mark for his presentation because that's exactly as I saw the uh, coming in of the uh, Eighth Air Force into the village. Oh, oh, oh. In February of, uh, uh, or the spring of 1942, when all this construction equipment came into my small village and pulled up all the hedges and trees, we laid the concrete and we built the buildings up. It was just exactly as Mark said this morning. Thank you very much. Cheers, Arthur. Thank you. What a fun day, huh? Sure was. Yeah, this is very cool. Uh, I was going to ask Steve or uh, Gary Luters or Patrick, do you want to talk about next month? Steve? Steve, you're muted. Oh. On your way out, but don't go yet. Hey, Steve. Oh. Do you want to talk about next month? That's what he's doing right now. That's what Bob's trying to do, but he's not on. I'm talking about it. Can you hear us? No, he can't hear you. That's what we need. No, to we can hear you, Bob. This is for these folks. Uh, oh, okay. Next month, we're going to do this. By the way, uh, Pat Chan and Gary Lutus do a great job, and Steve and everybody trying to put this thing together. Yeah. It's been tough. It's been a struggle, both logistics, getting a location, other things. Next month in January, when Jerry is telling his story, and that's going to be fantastic. We're expecting a much bigger crowd, and we'd like you guys to spread that word around, get some more people here if we can. We hope to get at least double, if not more, and we're going to do it in the Korea-Vietnam hangar here. Uh, the museum is putting up with us one more month, but it's a struggle because they have to tear down part of the museum and then get ready to go at 10 o'clock. So we're kind of becoming a little bit of a pain in the neck to them in that regard by setting this thing up in the morning. So probably in February, for our speaker in February, we're going to probably change location. And we've got a great deal, a great offer, you're all going to love it, at the American Legion Post in Palm Springs. It's a great 
look location value. You're not going to be selling the oil from the B-17, but it's it's a great, okay, that's our plan. There's things are in flux. Is that the way to say it? But anyway, spread the word. We'd like to get more people here, but before we go, sign the poster. And next month, be sure to be here. 